Welcome to CADM channel. Uh, today we are with the professor of uh, Areli University, uh, Jonathan Adler. Uh, and uh, Jonathan uh, recently published uh, a book, Origins of Judaism, uh, published by the Yale uh, University Press. And uh, before we are going uh, deeply into the, your research, could you please define what is actually a Judaism? That's an excellent question. Uh, super important to begin with the definitions. Um, for me and for my purposes of this book, Judaism refers to the Jewish way of life as it's been practiced for many hundreds of years, where um, the daily life is governed by observance of Torah law. When I say Torah law, I mean, I'm referring to essentially the, the Pentateuch, which is the, the foundational text for what I'm calling Torah here. Um, and on the basis of the Pentateuch, we have an entire system of law which grew up surrounding uh, th these Pentateuchal uh, texts. Um, the Jewish way of life, as I'm calling it, has been um, governed by this Torah law for centuries. And I'm, I'm referring to, to things like um, the Sabbath prohibitions, the various holi Jewish holidays, uh, eating matzot, uh, unleavened bread on Passover, um, refraining from leaven, from eating leaven, from owning leaven on Passover, fasting on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, um, building booths, uh, Sukkot, on the holiday of Sukkot, tabernacles. Uh, taking the four species, the, the palm branch and the citron and the myrtle and the willow, on the, the, the festival of Sukkot. The kashrut laws, the laws of the dietary prohibitions. Um, countless laws that govern the Jewish way of life from the time that a person wakes up in the morning until he goes to sleep at night, from cradle to grave. These laws uh, define what it means to be a Jewish person and, and have defined what it has meant to be a Jewish person for a long time. The question that I ask in this book is, when did all of this begin? So you, you asked, what do I mean when I talk about Judaism? This is what I'm referring to. Um, Judaism today can, can mean other things as well. We can refer to beliefs uh, that, that define Judaism. I'm not looking at beliefs. What I'm looking at in my book is practices. The, the practices, prohibitions that are defined by, by the Torah. And I'm looking to see when did this begin. It's important for me to, to, to state already from the beginning that I'm not looking at the question of when these ideas first came about. Right? So I'm not looking at the question of when did the idea of Shabbat begin? When did the idea of dietary laws begin? The, the, this is something which um, biblical scholars have been studying since the 19th century. And the best way to study that is by looking at the texts where these laws first appear. I'm not looking at that. I'm not looking at the question of intellectual history, which we can study through texts. I'm looking at a very different question. I'm looking at a question of social history, what people are actually doing. And when I speak about people, I'm interested in the masses, the regular, ordinary, everyday people, the farmers, the craftsmen, the homemakers, when did they begin to keep the laws of the Torah? When did they first learn about these laws? When did they know that they were in existence? When did they regard them as authoritative and actually put them into practice? This is, this is what I'm looking at in the book. So basically we have uh, two things. Uh, one is the text, yeah. okay, the, what you mentioned, the Bible, the Pentateuch, the five books uh, of uh, Moses. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other hand, we have an uh, archaeology. Mm -hmm. uh, and wh what's your method? Uh, how do you going to answer this question based on these two sources of information? Okay, so absolutely. We have two sources of information, texts and archaeology. Both of these are valid sources of, of, of data for, for going about answering uh, the, the question that I'm asking. What I do in the book is I have a, a very clear method, very simple method um, for answering this question, when does Judaism first emerge? What I do is I take a period of time about which we have a large amount of evidence which indicates that regular everyday Jews 
knew of the existence of the Torah, regarded it as authoritative, and were putting it into practice. That period of time is the first century of the Common Era. And so the first century, the period of time that we know from the, from the, the Gospels and from, uh, this is the period of time of Josephus, this is the period of time of uh, Philo of Alexandria. This is a period of time when we also have a tremendous amount of archaeological evidence, which indicates that Jews were observing the laws of the Torah. So if I have a time machine yeah. and I would uh, arrive to the first century BCE, I would definitely recognize you things would, which I know today absolutely. as a, related to the Jewish practice. Absolutely. They would look a little bit different, but you would absolutely be able to recognize that it's the same species, right, of, of Judaism, where, where, where people recognize the Torah. If you were to stop someone on the seventh day of the week and see if they were going, they wouldn't be going to work. Okay? If you were to stop someone on the 10th day of the seventh month, they would be fasting. Um, and you know, on, on Passover, they would, they, you wouldn't find leaven in their houses. This is, this is, the, the Judaism that you would find in the first century would be recognizable to you today. The question is, when does that begin? So the method that I use is that I take the first century as a benchmark, and then I go backwards in time. So I go backwards to the first century BCE the 2nd century BC to the 3rd century BC, and I'm looking for where the trail of evidence ends. And where the trail of evidence ends means that before that, I don't have any evidence. Okay? So in archaeological terms, we, use, we call this a terminus antiquem. What that means is that Judaism must have emerged where the trail of evidence ends or earlier. Right? Absence of evidence isn't necessarily evidence of absence. So it could be that people knew of the Torah and were regarded it as authoritative and were observing it in the period before we have evidence for that. that, that that's possible. But I think it's very important to put on the table where we have, what we have evidence for and what we don't have evidence for. Um, and to cut to the chase, uh, the conclusion, chapter after chapter, each chapter discusses a different set of practices and prohibitions. And what I, what I do with each chapter is I look to see, first century CE, what evidence we have, and what do we have before that. In chapter after chapter, I'm able to show that we don't have evidence before the middle of the second century BCE. So the middle of the second century BCE, that's the Hasmonean period. We have no evidence from before the Hasmonean period that regular, ordinary Judeans, the masses, knew about anything that we could call Torah, or that they were observe, observing such a thing uh, before the, second, the middle of the second century BCE. This is chapter after chapter after chapter. So we have a finding in uh, archaeology related to the Qumran uh, uh, site and the Judean desert. Uh, it's tefillin, uh, which you know as a phylacteries. But uh, in fact, uh, this material preserved in some uh, area specific to these uh, conditions in this area, which uh, allowed this uh, finding to be preserved. And it did not survive anywhere else. And uh, in fact, we have some quotes in the biblical text, which we may, we may relate to this tradition, or we may not, because they're quite vague. So how you decide actually, is, uh, what is the initial uh, time when the Jews started to use tefillin? Okay, so excellent question. And th it's, th this is a good example for the method. So what I, what I will do in a case like this, and I have a chapter on tefillin, by the way, also on mezuzot. So, you know, we have in the same two of the places which talk about putting a sign on the hand and totafot or a remembrance between the eyes. This is mentioned four places in the Pentateuch, twice in Exodus, twice in Deuteronomy. In the two sites in Deuteronomy, the two passages in Deuteronomy which have this, this commandment, there's also the commandment to, ha to inscribe on, the, on uh, the gates of your homes and on your cities. Um, so we, we call this mezuzot. The method that I just uh, described applies to this as well. So let's look for a period of time where we have this, where we have uh, indications that people are, are observing tefillin and mezuzah. We have this from the first century CE. You mentioned Qumran and the Judean desert. Um, that's where 
these, these uh, artifacts were preserved. They weren't preserved elsewhere. Presumably there were tefillin and mezuzot in Jerusalem and in other sites, but they weren't preserved because of the, the, the climate that you, that, that you mentioned. Okay, wh wh when do we have tefillin and mezuzah before the first century CE? So, we look and we have actually tefillin and perhaps also mezuzot from the first century before the common era and maybe even from the second century before the common era, the earliest tefillin and mezuzot that we have can be dated to the Hasmonean period. We don't have anything before. Now that doesn't mean, and I'd like to emphasize this, absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. The fact that we don't have tefillin and mezuzah before the middle of the second century BCE could be simply because people weren't, there weren't very many people living in the desert before the Hasmonean period. You didn't have Qumran, you didn't have other sites um, like that in the desert where such artifacts could have been preserved. So it could simply be that such evidence hasn't survived. But again, it's important to put on the table what we have evidence for and what we don't have evidence for. And if we look at practice after practice and other practices where I could expect there to be um, evidence, artifacts, and there aren't, that also says something. I'll, I'll give you another example of something which we do find preserved outside of the Judean desert, and which I would expect to find if it did exist, stone vessels. So we know, for example, that um, the, the Torah in the Leviticus says that if, you, uh, that if you have a pottery vessel into which a crawling thing, a creepy thing, fell into, you have to break the pottery vessel. And this is in Leviticus 11. Um, and at th when we're going back to the first century of the common era, uh, we know that Jews were producing vessels made of stone, stone vessels, because they understood that pottery becomes impure, but and wood can become impure as well. It says in Leviticus 11 that if wood becomes impure, you have to put it into water. Stone isn't mentioned in the list of, of materials. And Jews started to produce vessels made of stone because they understood if stone isn't written in the, in the Torah, then it must not become impure at all. Uh, so stone was considered a material impervious to ritual purity, and Jews everywhere that Jews lived in Judea, in Galilee, in Pariah, on the other side of the Jordan River, any Jewish site that we excavate, we find these stone vessels. This is a clear indication that Jews at this time, the first century CE, were observing the rules of ritual purity, the rules of ritual purity that are written in the Torah. We find these stone vessels in the first century BCE as well, okay? And maybe also at the end of the second century BCE, but not before. Nobody was producing these vessels before the Hasmonean period. Stone is a material which survives. This isn't the leather, this isn't the skin material like you have the tefillin, which I wouldn't expect to survive. Stone is a material which survives, but we don't find it before the Hasmonean period give you another example of uh, finds, which we would expect to find if they existed, but we don't. Um, ritual immersion pools. Very similar to the stone vessels. They appear just around the same time, the end of the second century BCE. Anywhere where there's a Jewish site that we excavate, we will find usually many ritual immersion pools. These are stepped pools, plastered, um, which we find only at Jewish sites. What were these used for? They were used by Jews to ritually purify themselves. They begin to appear in the Hasmonean period, and from then until today, we find ritual immersion pools wherever you know, there are observant Jewish uh, families living. They don't appear before the Hasmonean period. So th this is the method that I use in the book. I look to see the earliest evidence that we have, the earliest positive evidence that we have, for observance of, of the Torah laws. When we have in the Bible, in the Torah, when we have the text rela texts related to the reforms, religious uh, ones, usually it's uh, always saying like, wow, we found something new and uh, this was uh, forgotten for years and uh, never practiced since uh, times of the judges, for yes. example. Yeah. Josiah, Josiah and Hezekiah. Yeah. So it's actually a written uh, evidence about the real uh, religious practices of that time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we find, as you say, we find in, the, in biblical uh, narratives, a number of biblical narratives. We find it with Josiah, we find it with Hezekiah. 
We find it with uh, Ezra, where um, in the various narratives they put it back to either the time of the judges or the time of, uh, of Joshua uh, or the time of, of, of Solomon that, uh, law, that rules such as um, commandments such as the Passover sacrifice or building booths on the, the Sukkot um, that hadn't been kept for centuries. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the biblical narrative itself never describes ancient Judeans or ancient Israelites as keeping the laws of the Torah. That, that, that's, not the no, that's not the narrative of the, of the biblical text itself. Um, the narrative is, to the, to, to the contrary, the narrative is that the Judeans and the Israelites are not keeping the laws of the Torah. So the, the, the authors of these texts clearly wanted ancient Israelites to be keeping the laws of the Torah. They thought that the laws of the Torah are something which people should be keeping. And that's what we find in the biblical texts. But the question that interests me is, were people actually keeping the laws of the Torah? And as you, as you say, the, the biblical story itself is that people weren't keeping the laws. So what, what, what I'm doing in the book is I'm not looking at the biblical story. I'm looking at data. I'm looking at actual data that we find either in contemporary texts or in archaeological uh, artifacts, which indicate that people are actually keeping the laws of the Torah. Uh, if you are taking the subject of uh, six depictions, uh, what could you say at what time we see that the people refrain from... Uh, from, from depicting humans and, 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 yes. and animals. So th th that's a, <laughs> what, one of the laws of the Torah, which we can actually look at from an archeological perspective and from a textual perspective. So again, the, the method that I'm using is I'm looking at the first century of the common era as my benchmark. In the first century CE, we have actually quite a bit of, uh, of, of remains, archeological remains, which uh, with Jewish, uh, with Jewish artwork, uh, we have uh, uh, mosaic floors. We have funerary art uh, on sarcophagi and on uh, ossuaries, bone boxes uh, that were were being used at the time. Burial caves with with art. The art is always without um, without figural figural little depiction. So we never have humans or animals. It's always either geometric depictions um, or floral and almost without exception we do not have figural art uh, in the Jewish art of the first uh, century. What really stands out are the coins. On coins what we would expect to find on coins and what we do find on coins everywhere except for in Judea is the face, the portrait of the leader of the uh, uh, of, of the ruler of the, the ruler of the ruler so we have yeah. you know either the uh, the caesar the emperor or we have uh, the king depending on w which period of time and where we're talking about but you always have the ruler on the coins because this was this was his way of, of propaganda not in judea the judeans never put humans or animals on uh, on their coins even the Roman governors, the Roman procurators that were ruling Judea in the first century, never put the emperor on the coins. They, they didn't want to irk the ire uh, of the local Judeans. So you never find the emperor on the, even the coins that the Romans minted in Judea. Um, and we have this in the first century CE. We have this in the first century before the common era, and even in the second century before the common era. So on the coins of the Hasmoneans, for example, I have here um, a coin, a bronze coin from one of the first uh, Hasmonean rulers. The, the first Hasmonean ruler to mint coins was John Hyrcanus I. This is one of his coins. And we can see here, if you look here, Alex, what do you see here? This isn't a face. It's a text. It's a text. It's a very dense text, right? So we have lots and lots of uh, Paleo-Hebrew letters covering the whole... Uh, the face of the coin. What it says here is in Hebrew, Yochanan a Kohen Hakadol Rosh Chever Hayudim. A lot of text. In English, jo uh, John, the high priest, the head of the assembly of the Jews. Okay, what is this? 
This isn't a, a portrait. I would call this a textual portrait. So instead of the portrait, which we would expect, so we have a description. We have fact. a description. We have his title and a description of, of his role. <laughs> of his role, exactly what, what. But it's clearly in place of an actual portrait. To my mind, when I see this, this is saying very clearly that the highest echelons of the Judean um, of the Judean government of the Hasmoneans is keeping the rules of the Torah, is keeping the second commandment that says you shall not uh, make an, any images, right? This is the earliest evidence that we have. The earliest coins of John Harkonnes are from about 132, 131 before the Common Era. From coins that we have before this, from the third century BCE, we have Jude Judean coins, coins that were minted in Judea, but they have already uh, figural art. So the, there's a, a, an eagle on one side and on the other side, the face of the Talmaic king. And when we go backwards even further, the 4th century BCE, now we're in the Persian period, we have on every single coin that was minted in Judea by Judean rulers, there's always figural art, either human faces or animals or sometimes even gods, foreign gods, minted on the coins, on Judean coins. There's a coin that has the name of the high priest, Yohanan HaKohen, John the priest, who was the, the high priest in Jerusalem, minted a coin with the owl of Athena on it. So this, what we find from the Hasmonean period and onwards, this um, refusal to put any kind of figural art on the coins in deference to the laws of the Torah, it only begins in the Hasmonean period. We don't have any evidence for it before that. Professor Adler, how about Kashrut? Okay, kashrut, I have a, a chapter on, on kashrut. Kashrut meaning the dietary laws. So, um, again, the method that I use in the book is to look at the first century CE as the benchmark. In the first century CE, we have a lot of evidence that ordinary, regular Judeans were keeping the laws of the Torah regarding kashrut, regarding the, the dietary laws. So we have, for example, Roman <coughs> and Greek authors writing that Jews refrain from eating pig. Okay, we have even, there's a, a story that Augustus would joke, well, this is the end of the first century BC, Augustus joked about Herod, who was known to have been uh, a murderous, murderous king. He killed his wives and his children. Augustus said about Herod, I would prefer to be Herod's pig rather than his son, because his son he would kill, his pig Herod didn't, wouldn't eat pig, so, so he wouldn't kill his pig. Um, the point is that we have a lot of evidence that Jews were not eating what was prohibited in the Torah in the first century of the Common Era. We have some evidence from the first century before the Common Era, and even some evidence from the late second century before the Common Era. Nothing before that. Alex, you know, you know your Hebrew Bible. Where do we have in the Hebrew Bible a story about somebody who refrained from eating pig uh, because it, because it's 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 prohibited in the Torah. We don't find that. I think we don't find it anywhere. We don't find it anywhere. We don't find in any texts uh, that that Jews or Israelites were refraining from eating this or that food because it's 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 prohibited in the, in the Torah. Um, so so uh, kashrut the, the dietary laws are a very good example of this. We are all are familiar with the synagogues yeah. uh, these days. <laughs> what you can say about it? Okay, so the synagogue is actually, again, going back to the first century of the common era, the synagogue is a, a very important institution uh, amongst Jews all throughout the Roman Empire. Um, we have both texts and archaeological evidence for the synagogue in the first century of the common era. Uh, the Gospel texts, which talk about Jesus um, visiting synagogues throughout Galilee, getting up and, and, and preaching in, in synagogues. The syn when we think about a synagogue today, we think of, what's the first thing we think about? Prayer, right? Prayer is the, 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 the main thing that goes on in, in a synagogue today. But in the first century, that wasn't the case. In the first century, synagogues were an educational institution. Jews would come to the synagogue one day a week, 
on Shabbat, on Saturday, when they weren't working, and they would get together and listen to somebody who would read from the Torah. We have to remember that when we're talking about antiquity, the assumption is that most people were illiterate. Most people were illiterate, and almost nobody owned books. So today, everyone has in their pocket this little uh, glass rectangle that has all of human knowledge on it. Right? It wasn't that way in the past. Even before we had the internet, we had books. Right? We had libraries full of books. But in antiquity, almost nobody had access to books. But what we did have was the synagogue. And what would happen is people would come together one day a week, everyone in the community, and the few people that did know how to read would read in front of the whole community what it says in the Torah. And they would read it and then interpret it. This is, we find this in, in the Gospel texts, we find it in stories in Acts, when Paul is, uh, is traveling around the, the Eastern uh, Mediterranean, and he's visiting synagogues on Shabbat, and sometimes he's asked to read, uh, and then afterwards he's also asked to, to, to give a little sermon. Right? So basically what we have here is two things. We have a, a, a reading, a, a more formal reading of the Torah, and then an interpretation of the reading. To my mind, the synagogue is the, is the central institution or the central vehicle for the spread of Judaism. It's hard to imagine how Judaism could have really spread without something like the synagogue, without an institution which could have served to instruct people on what it says in the Torah. We have lots of evidence for the existence of synagogues in the first century of the Common Era. The first century BCE, we have archaeological evidence actually, the earliest synagogue, the earliest physical uh, remains of a synagogue that we have are from the Hasmonean period. Uh, at Umel Umdan in the, the Judean Shvela. Um, that's the earliest evidence that we have. There's no evidence for the synagogue before, before the Hasmonean period. So again, all of the evidence seems to be ho homing in on the Hasmonean period. It's hard to imagine how Judaism could have emerged before we have some way to spread this idea. Um, and again, it's the Hasmonean period when, 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 this first, uh, when this first emerges. But if we speak about the archaeology, we have very interesting finding of text, and the uh, texts are, they are always uh, very rare and uh, uh, very informative. And we have a text uh, written and sent from Jerusalem uh, to the Judaite colony in Elephantine, in Egypt, uh, where probably some uh, uh, Judaic uh, troops were stationed uh, at the time. And in fact, in this text, we have a clear uh, instructions, what seems to us as clear instructions, how to celebrate a holiday, Passover. Yeah, okay, so very good question. Um, and in the book, I, I, I discuss this. Uh, so this, this uh, papyrus that you're referring to uh, is often called the Passover letter. Um, and if we look at this papyrus, so we can see that uh, the papyrus uh, has been reconstructed. Uh, it, it's originally written in uh, Aramaic. And the papyrus talks about the, uh, the observance of, of Passover. It's a seven-day holiday from the 15th of the month of Nisan until the 21st of the month of Nisan. For seven days you shall celebrate it. You shall eat uh, unleavened bread, matzot, uh, on this holiday. And you shall take out unleaven. Uh, excuse me. You shall take out leaven from your home. Uh, chametz. Uh, it should not be seen in your home. Uh, you shall not eat chametz, and you shall not drink any beer. Right. So we have all of these rules that are written in this in this papyrus. And one would think that this is very good evidence that regular ordinary Judeans know about the rules of the Torah and are keeping the rules of the Torah. The problem with this evidence is that if we look to see what happens when we remove all of the reconstructed parts of the text, there's no longer anything about Passover. All of the parts of, the, of this letter, the so-called so Passover letter, which talk about Passover, are in the reconstructed parts. So 
I think it's okay if we are to assume that the Torah was well known in the 5th century. By the way, this dates to the 5th century, the end of the 5th century, uh, 4, 19, 420 before the Common Era. Um, if we were to assume that, that, that at this time the Torah was, was well known, people who knew about the Torah were keeping it, then it would be okay to reconstruct Passover into the, into the papyrus. Um, but once, we're, once we make this reconstruction, we can then go and say this is evidence that the Torah was well known and was being observed, right? That would be called a circular argument. And so it's one thing to make the reconstruction, but then to take that reconstruction and to use it as evidence that this thing existed and was well known, you can't do that. It's a logical fallacy. So the so-called Passover letter, once we remove all of the reconstructed parts, it's no longer the Passover letter, it's just the Elephantine letter. So if we are trying to track it down, the Judaism, the beginning of Judaism, where almost do not find it in the Old Testament, in the Torah. But uh, what about the New Testament? It's, uh, do we have a clear evidence of the Judaism there? So it's one of the things that I discovered as, as, as I was writing this book, I discovered, I, it really came home to me um, that when, when we look in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, um, we, we don't find Judaism. We don't find the Israelites practicing the laws of the Torah, as, as I mentioned uh, before. But when we look at the New Testament, we do. Right? We find the, all of the followers of Jesus. Jesus himself, of course, was, was Jewish, and all of his followers uh, who, who lived at, all of his followers who lived at the time were all Torah-observing Jews. And we find Judaism in the New Testament, but not in the Old Testament. So, for example, when Jesus is crucified, he's crucified on a Friday. Um, and it says that he was, he was brought down from the cross and buried, put into the tomb before, before Shabbat began, and, and his followers uh, observed the Shabbat, right? Um, and it was only after Shabbat that they were able to, to, to prepare the, uh, the, the, the spices and everything that, that, that was needed for the, uh, for the tomb. This observance of Shabbat we find in the New Testament, and we find it during the life of Jesus as well. There's uh, discussions about the, the precise laws, what, exactly how the laws of Shabbat need to be kept. There are discussions, there are arguments about exactly how the laws of Shabbat need to be kept. But there's no doubt that there's Shabbat, that regular, ordinary Jews are keeping the laws of Shabbat. We don't find that in the Old Testament. We don't find that in the Hebrew Bible. So it, it, it's ironic in a way that we have Judaism in the New Testament because the New Testament is talking about a period of time when Judaism already exists, but we don't have that in the, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible. So actually in your book, you point to a very specific period of Hasmonean rule. And could you explain actually a little bit about the Hasmonean rule in general and why Specifically, at this time, at that time, we see actually a, a rise of uh, Judaism and we see observance of the Judaism as we know it today, the rules of Judaism. Right. So I, I want to make very clear again that um, what I'm able to say for sure is that I do not know of any evidence that predates the Hasmonean period for observance of, 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 of the Torah. That doesn't mean that the Torah began to be observed in the Hasmonean period, because again, absence of evidence is not necessarily evidence of absence. So there, it could have been that regular everyday Judeans, regular um, uh, the masses, could have been observing Judaism before the Hasmonean period, and we simply don't have evidence for it. It's a, it's a possibility. But the fact is that we don't have any evidence before the Hasmonean period. How do I explain that? So first of all, um, I don't know. I don't know. By definition, because our terminus antiquem is the Hasmonean period, by definition, I don't have evidence before that. And here I can only conjecture. Um, and in my book, in the last chapter of my book, I suggest two possibilities for how, how Judaism might have emerged. Um, one possibility is that Judaism perhaps emerged under the Hasmoneans themselves. And the suggestion that I make, again, it's, it's conjectural. I don't 
I don't have evidence for this, but it's a possibility, is that it was the Hasmoneans themselves who adopted uh, the Torah as the, 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 the law of the land. Right? The Hasmoneans, just a little bit of a background to, to, to who the Hasmoneans were and, and what was going on at the time, so we're speaking about the Hellenistic period. This is a period when we have a very large um, Hellenistic, Greek-speaking and Greek-cultured kingdom in the north, the Seleucid kingdom. We have another Hellenistic, Greek-speaking kingdom in the south, in Egypt, uh, the Ptolemaic kingdom. So one was ruling out of Alexandria. The, the so actually, the, those are the remainings of the great empire of Alexander. Exactly. So Alexander the Great... Uh, conquered the the Persian yes. Empire um, in the 330s of the before the Common Era, and his generals split up his kingdom after his death. After his death, yes. and the the for our area of the world, the two big kingdoms were the Ptolemaic Kingdom in Egypt and the Seleucid Kingdom uh, in in the northern areas. Um, Judea so was this the, is the time when the Hasmonean rulers emerged. Okay, so Ju Judea was right in the middle. And in the third century before the Common Era, it was the Ptolemaic Kingdom that was ruling over Judea. In the second, the beginning of the second century, it was the Seleucid Kingdom that was that was ruling over Judea. Um, what happened was once the Seleucid Kingdom was ruling over Judea, it's a long story. I won't get into all the the, the history of it, but um, there was a, a revolt. The Judeans revolted against the Seleucid Kingdom. There was apparently some kind of persecutions uh, that, that uh, Antiochus IV uh, was, had perpetrated against the Judeans, um, perhaps related to the cult in the Temple of Jerusalem, and there was a revolt that broke out, led by the Hesmonean family. So we have Mattathias and his uh, five sons, uh, the most famous was uh, Judah Maccabeus, um, that revolted against the, the Seleucid uh, kingdom. And eventually, over the course of a few decades, the Judeans uh, received independence, or they uh, bought themselves independence, they fought for and, and received independence from the Seleucid kingdom. And it could be that these Hasmonean rulers decided that they needed some kind of, of law that would uh, bind the Judean people together in their newly independent uh, state. And it could be that they decided that the Torah, which perhaps existed for centuries, but was maybe on a shelf somewhere, um, perhaps in the temple, we don't know. But they took this text and said, this is now going to be the law of the land. Um, in my book, I gave, uh, I, I suggest that this might have been like the uh, constitution of this new state. But it's not only a constitution, because there's also the story of the, the beginning of this, of this people. How, how did the Israelites first emerge? That story is in the Torah, right? From Genesis through all the, the patriarchs and the Exodus, the story of the emergence, the genesis of the Jewish people appears in the Torah. So I, I, I suggest that this might have been a sort of amalgamated declaration of independence and constitution together as the Torah. This was what the Hasmoneans adopted as um, both the, the origin story and the law of the land uh, in the second century before the Common Era. I cannot prove this, but it's, it's a possibility which I suggest. Something that we do know happened at the end of the second century is that the Hasmonean um, state slowly expanded. John Harkonnes I, we know, conquered Edomea, the area uh, to the south of Judea. And when he conquered Edomea, we have a number of texts which tell us that he enforced the laws of the Torah on the Edomeans. So, for example, he forced them to be circumcised, and also he forced the other laws of the Torah onto the people of, of Edumea. Um, we know that John Hyrcanus's successor, Judah Aristobulus, when he conquered areas to the north, um, he conquered a, people's, a people called the Eturians. And these Eturians were also forced to, uh, to observe the laws of the Torah, just like the Edumeans. So we know that this is something that Hasmonean rulers were doing. They were 
They were bringing the Torah to the peoples that they were conquering and forcing them to keep the laws of the Torah. I don't think it's too far a stretch to suggest that perhaps the Hasmonean rulers before John Hyrcanus, let's say in the middle of the second century, were doing exactly this with the Judeans themselves. It could be that uh, the predecessors of John Harkonnes, Simon, for example, and Jonathan, uh, who, who, who ruled before him, perhaps were the ones that brought the Torah to the Judeans themselves. Again, I, I want to stress, I'm not suggesting that the Torah didn't exist before the Hasmoneans. There's no doubt that the Torah did exist, probably for centuries before the Hasmoneans. My point is that it's only from the period of the Hasmoneans and onwards that we find evidence that the masses, the regular, ordinary, everyday people, knew about this Torah and were observing it. So, Professor Adler, could you please make a summary of uh, when the Judaism started? Okay. So, so, so again, I, I, I want to make it very clear. The first six chapters of my book focus on, on the data, right? It's data-driven. And what I can say, I can put this on the table as what we know. We know that there's no evidence, or we do not have any evidence from before the Hasmonean period for anything that looks like Judaism, anything that looks like um, mass knowledge of and acknowledgement of and observance of, of the Torah. What happened before that, we can only conjecture. Um, and it's when we look at the Persian period, which is the period of time which scholars until now have generally thought that Judaism emerged, not only do we not have positive evidence for the for for massive observance of the Torah, we actually have some some negative evidence. Um, so, for example, if we look at Persian period uh, Jerusalem, we have evidence that Judeans were eating catfish, which is a, a species of fish which, according to the Torah, is, is prohibited because it doesn't have scales. Um, so, throughout the Iron Age and into the Persian period, we have catfish in Jerusalem. Um, we have on the coins I mentioned before, we have uh, human and animal figures and even foreign gods on Judean coins that are being minted in the Persian period. When we look outside of Judea, we, when we look at Elephantine, we have the texts that are preserved on papyri and on uh, ostraca, broken pottery fragments with inscriptions, we have mention of foreign gods. J Judeans are, are naming their children after foreign gods. And are, uh, and are giving oaths to foreign gods, giving uh, donations to, to, to foreign gods. Uh, also in Babylonia, in the Murashu archive and the Al Yahudu archive, these are archives that we have which mention Judeans living in Babylonia during the Babylonian and Persian periods. We have again Judeans giving oaths to foreign gods and naming their children after foreign gods. So the evidence that we do have from the Persian period doesn't look like people are keeping laws of the Torah. To the contrary, I should also mention in Elephantine, there's a temple. There's a Judean temple to the Judean god in Egypt, which goes against the the, the rule in Deuteronomy that you're not supposed to be offering sacrifices outside of the place that that, that God will will choose, which is in Cisjordan, right? In presumably in Jerusalem. Building a temple in Egypt goes against that rule, but yet we find a temple in Egypt during the Persian period. So all the evidence that we do have from the Persian period looks like Judaism isn't known. The earliest evidence we have is from the Hasmonean period. The Persian period looks like there is no Judaism. I think that the most promising period of time to look for the emergence of Judaism is after the Persian period. So the period after the, the conquests of Alexander the Great uh, the Hellenistic period uh, seems to be the most uh, likely time when Judaism first emerged. I said that I gave two suggestions for when Judaism could have emerged, either the Hasmonean period or perhaps before the Hasmonean period. It's possible that Judaism could have emerged in the time right before that, during the third century of the Common Era. This is a period of time when uh, the Ptolemaic dynasty was ruling over, over Judea. Um, and 
we know that it was the Greeks that invented the notion of written law. So before the, re the Greeks, there was law, right? We have in the Code of Hammurabi and Ashnuna and the various Mesopotamian law collections. We have laws, right? law existed. But we didn't have what we would call written law, where I could point to a, a text, I could point to a code and say, this is the law, right? This didn't exist. So the, has, the um, Mesopotamian law collections were probably function more like um, a, a, a textbook, a legal textbook that you would find today that law students would study, right? That's not the law itself. The law itself wasn't written. Um, but the Greeks did invent this notion of written law. And it could be that when the Judeans first came under the sway of the Hellenistic of Hellenistic culture after the, the conquest of Alexander the Great, that they decided that they, they too needed some kind of written law. And it could be that that's when uh, the Torah was adopted as, as the law of the Judeans. So that would take it to a little bit before the Hasmoneans, perhaps the third century of the Common Era. There's no evidence for this. This, this is conjecture. But it's a possibility that I suggest in the book that perhaps the Torah began to be observed by the masses in the third century of the Common Era. Um, what seems clear is that the Persian period is not the best period of time to be seeking the origins of Judaism. It's probably sometime after that, sometime during the Hellenistic period, whether it's in the early Hellenistic period, let's say the third century of the Common Era, or the later Hellenistic period, once the Hasmoneans have, a, have an independent state. But the, the Hellenistic period is, to my mind, the best period of time to be seeking uh, the emergence of, of Judaism. Professor Adler, thank you very much. You are the author of the book Origins of the Judaism. We will place the link, uh, affiliated link, uh, in the description of the movie and you can uh, get this book. And uh, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. Thank you. Thanks you for having me, Alex.